brothers and sisters, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I want to talk to you about three children. These are not just the children of their parents, they are the children of the Ummah. They are the children of all American Muslims. They are our children, Dia, Yusuf, and Razan. These three Muslim kids who were killed so brutally, so mercilessly, and for such a frivolous, frivolous reason, if that is true, in North Carolina three days ago. I went on the Facebook page of Dia, and it is amazing that his last status was that he had just distributed dental hygiene products to 75 homeless people. He just finished doing that. That was the last thing he did. SubhanAllah, before he was killed. In a very beautiful hadith, Prophet says that those who leave their home in pursuit of knowledge, and as long as they are in their journey seeking knowledge, until they come back home, they are in a state of jihad. People often think of jihad as a military thing. It is just one and lesser component of jihada, which is struggle. We all struggle. Life is a struggle. But then there is an, another spiritual dimension to this struggle, which is the struggle in the path of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said that those who leave home in pursuit of knowledge, and until they come back home, they are in a state of jihad. I particularly, obvious, for obvious reasons, like this hadith very much. In fact, I consider that my migration from India to America was in pursuit of knowledge. I came here to study. And if I don't go back, I consider myself in a continuous state of jihad. And may Allah also see it that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُخْتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاقًا Do not consider those who have died in the path of Allah as dead. Those who have been killed in the path of Allah as dead. They are not dead. بَلْ أَحْيَانْ وَلَيْكِنْ لَا تَشْرُونَ You do not understand it. You do not perceive because they are alive. Allah is saying that even though they have been killed in the path. So, so with these children, we can console ourselves with these traditions and with these verses from the Quran that indeed they are blessed that they have been killed in the path of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them in this Jannah inshallah with the best. They were adults for less than six, seven years. And apparently from their life, we can tell that they spend their few years of adulthood in doing good. Dia, the boy who was studying to become a dentist, volunteered with doctors beyond borders and went to Palestine, in the West Bank, and helped poor people with their dental hygiene needs. All of that is recorded and it's coming out. So these kids who had less than five, six, seven years of adult life have spent them as role models for American Muslims and for Muslims everywhere and for all people. That they have benefited from what God has given them. They are beautiful, good-looking, well-off, intelligent, successful. But they are also, subhanAllah, people who are mousing, who are doing good. They are trying to help others. And that is an important message. Before I came to Delaware, I was living in a small town called Adrian. Literally in the middle of nowhere, no airport, no bus, no train, nothing. Nothing goes to Adrian except one small road. And there were only 11 Muslim families. So when I went there, I discovered that, oh my God, there is no Juma in this town, so we had to travel a lot. And two or three of us would go every Juma to pray with go to Toledo. So I tried my best. I needed six or seven men to show up in my basement so we could pray at the Jama. So I met with all the families and I discovered that one of the families was a Palestinian family whose son was going to my college. And so eventually I got to know this boy. He studied, he took all my classes, and we used to play tennis, and sometimes I used to travel a lot in those days, it was post 9-11 days. So I used to come to Washington practically every week. And sometimes I would come back home late. 
So leave home at 5 in the morning, come back at 12, and this boy would drive me to Toledo Airport or Detroit Airport in the morning and pick me up at night. And one fine day, poof, he was shot and killed. Just like that. The government in the morning looked at the newspaper and front page news is he's dead. He was shot by another man who walked into the house and shot him. Oh, it was heartbreaking. It was heartrending. But the most painful moment for me was when I met with his mother. In this two years that we had known the family, we had got very friendly with him, especially the mom, who was such a wonderful person. Every time I was out of town, she would come to our house, she would leave food, she would take care of my wife as a daughter in the case. So when I went to see her, she caught my hand and she said, Professor, we left our homeland, we left our people, we left our culture, we left our weapon, we left our nation to come here only so that something like this should not happen. Why did I leave Palestine? If my son had to die, why didn't he die there? Why did he have to die here? It was heartbreaking. I had read many times that the worst thing that can happen to parents is to bury their children in their own life. And to bury two who died so violently, I can just imagine the pain of these people. The most painful moment for me was when my father died a few years ago, 10, 11, 12 years ago. It was unbearable. I was like a robot after his death. No emotional response, nothing. I, the first thing I did was to look at my mother's passport and discover that she had visa to the US, which was going to expire in 13 days. So in 12 days, I had to do everything, sell the house, pack everything, and bring my mother. I didn't want to leave her back home. But it was on the flight that I kept, I was feeling very upset. I said, I've become your team, lost my father. And then I remembered something very sad about the Prophet the fact that he lost both his sons and his father in his life. And that to me was, I said, Ya Allah, if you do this to the person you love the most, who are we? If you can do this to the people you love the most, who are we? So this is something that everybody has to experience. But there is more to this pain. This pain is not something, especially this particular incident in North Carolina, it is not just the death of three beautiful people. It is an assault. It is an assault on our humanity. It is an assault on our community. It is an assault on us. And it is our job to respond to it, to defend ourselves. But before we can respond to these, these, these are horrible things, we have to understand what it is. When 9-11 happened, for many years, there was no anger towards Muslims in this country. There was a shock, and this country was shocked and grief. Nothing like this had ever happened. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, America was the sole superpower, the world's most powerful country. At the peak of its power, it had been hit, and it had never been hit before. It was like the Pearl Harbor, even worse than that, because you could watch it on TV. In spite of that, from 2001 to 2004 and 5, if you look at public opinion <coughs> service in the United States, there was no escalation in anti-Muslim sentiment in this country. People were more curious about Islam than hatred. If you remember those of you, there was all this talk about how the Quran was being sold, become bestseller, people were reading about Islam, literally thousands of books were published and people were in fact converting to Islam more after 9-11 than before 9-11. But things began to change after 2004 and 2005 and you see these things. There was a new hatred towards Islam and Muslims. And it was all based on terrorism. Muslims are terrorists. Slogans such as all terrorists, may, all Muslims may not be terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. This had become very popular <coughs> slogans across the board. But a lot of this was driven by two entities, new conservative politicians in the media, and many, many types of Christian pastors in their churches. So the hatred was coming from churches and from politicians. 
the politicians were spewing the head, at least with a political purpose. They wanted to ratchet up support for wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. And some of the preachers saw this as an opportunity to prevent the assault that they saw of Islam, the growth of Islam in the West. Islam has been for the last 20, 30 years, alhamdulillah, the fastest growing religion on every continent. <coughs> and they thought that this assault on Islam, which was being justified, to cut it. So you saw this escalation, but it was associated with terrorism. And as people read more and more, more critical view of American foreign policy, people started learning about the history of of imperialism, etc., they began to at least understand why there was so much anger in that part of the world towards the West. But in the last few years, the last four or five years, there is another new kind of anti-Muslim sentiment which is coming out. It's coming from groups who are known as new atheists, people like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, comedians like Bill Maher, etc., on the shows. These new comedians and commentators and scientists who are all atheists. They are new kinds of atheists. In the past, atheists were those who didn't believe in anything. But now these atheists have firm beliefs, and one of their firm beliefs is that religion itself is bad. So they are not exactly atheists, they are anti-theists. They are against religion and against God. And for them, Islam has become the easiest target because they want to use uh, the so-called violation of women's rights in Muslim countries, terrorism, absence of democracy, Muslim on Muslim violence, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, etc. as a way to make the argument that religion itself is bad. This killer in North Carolina was an anti-theist on his Facebook pages, in his social media, he repeatedly expressed anger towards religion per se. He hated people of religion. So when people say that he, this is a parking dispute, I don't believe it. He had parking disputes with lots of people for months. In fact, some of his neighbors say that we have never seen him except when he is fighting with somebody. But the only people he shot and killed in a manner which is like execution, he shot them in their house, in their head. He walked in and shot them in their head. That gap from fighting and shouting to killing was, in my opinion, bridged by his hatred of people who are religious and he saw these three children as religious people. The two sisters wore hijab. Their social media was about their role. They were both active in the Muslim Students Association. That's where they met. They were just been married for only six weeks. This morning, one of my friends was saying that her best friend was the photographer at this wedding, and she has not yet delivered the album, she was still working on that and she doesn't know what to do, she's in agony. And it is also driven by this new desire to make Islam an electoral issue in American politics. If you remember in the 2002 election, one of the biggest issues was the World Trade Center mosque that Imam Faisal Nahu was trying to build. How can we have a mosque? That was such a hateful thing. What was hateful most about it was the message that was being sent to people in America was that in America's sacred places, listen to me very carefully, the message that was being sent was that in America's sacred places, which 9-11's ground zero has now become a sacred place for America, it is like Karbala, or the Shia, it's a sacred place. In America's sacred places, there is no place for Muslims and their sacred things. That was the message. And you know, the irony was that there was only one place of worship in the World Trade Center towers, and that was a masjid. There were no temples or synagogues or churches in the World Trade Center building. There was a place that you could pray, Juma Salah. 
So not a mosque, but it was a place where you could go, Musallah, you could pray, other salah too. And now, it, so the method, it is this rhetoric that has been going on for the last three, four years, which has created an environment of hatred. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, let not a people humiliate and mock and deride another people. It is quite possible that they are better than that. And this is a message for all of us, not just to Americans who are mocking Islam, but also for Muslims who demonize others. There is a lot of intra-Muslim Islamophobia. I, I jokingly tell my students that Muslims are the only people who get high without alcohol. They get high on how many Muslims are there in the world. Mashallah, 1.5 billion. Mashallah, 1.7. Like in two minutes, they go from 1.5 billion to 1.7 billion Muslims. And then if you listen to the same brother for a little while, he'll start by saying, Shias are not Muslims, Ahmadiyyas are not Muslims, and blah, 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 down with Sufis. And at the end of the conversation, he's the only Muslim standing there. So he goes high and low. So it is like this. We are also part of this whole idea of demonizing other people. So there is Islam of so course. This message is not just for non-Muslims, but for us. But now what has happened is there are two things which are driving there. One, that the, the, I don't know how to say, but this hijab on not talking negatively directly about other people, this political correctness, which sort of covered most of Western discourses, has been torn apart when it comes to Islam. Now people can go on television and say bad things about Islam, there are no consequences. They can generalize about Islam. One of the presidential candidates and Republican, he promised people that if he became president, he would never have a Muslim in the cabinet. It's amazing. Replace that word Muslim with black or Jew and see what happens. If any presidential candidate say that if I became president, I will not have a Jew in my cabinet, he's finished, they'll run him out of the town. Remember what happened to Mel Gibson? When he was drunk, he was not even in census. If someone said that when I become president, I'll make sure that there is no black in my cabinet, he's finished. Doesn't matter how great he might have been before that moment, but if he says that. But people can say these things about Muslims, that when I become president, there will be no Muslim in the cabinet, and he can get away. In fact, it becomes a source of fundraising. This, this bus is out of the garage. It's very difficult to push it back into the garage. It's become okay. And then when episodes like Charlie Hebdo happens in Paris, and it gets cover to cover media, 24-7 media cover, wherever you see, it is just this. We did this for Anna Prophet this has been avenged. This statement which generates hate. Media is supposed to cover the news and cover bad events, but not become the inciter of bad events. Unfortunately, today, the media is becoming an inciter of Islamophobia and hatred towards Muslims rather than being critical of it. It is the job of Islamophobia to cut it down. It is a fascinating week for media. Brian Williams has been exposed as a habitual liar. America's most trusted news anchor has been exposed as a habitual, pointless, meaningless lie. Prophet said there are some sifat of a munafiq. And one of the characters of munafiq is when he opens his mouth, he lies. For no reason, not to save your life, not to show up, it's just a habit. And if this is the habit of our most trusted anchor, what does it tell us about our media? This event that happened in North Carolina, He's been triggered by this atmosphere of hatred towards Muslims which has been generated across the world. If you look at opinion polls of Americans, of Europeans, of Hindus worldwide towards Islam and Muslims, it has never been this bad before. Only 40% Americans have no negative view of Muslims. Even in America, it is a peculiar situation where the views about Islam are negative and slightly positive about American Muslims. 
So at least Americans are at least sophisticated enough to say, okay, Islam may be a bad religion, look what's happening in Iraq and other places, but American Muslims are not that bad. They actually say our Muslims are not that bad, unlike European Muslims. But that is not the point. The point is we have initiated a conversation which encourages hate. It's not going to end there. This is just the beginning. This week alone, a young Muslim boy in Kansas was killed as he stepped out of the mosque because somebody drove a car straight at him and killed him. He was about 15 years old. In Canada, there have been so many attacks on sisters wearing hijab. And the fact that there is so much coverage about this person's also attacks and justification that he may have done this for parking purposes, whatever, I always tell my students, it's very easy to tell that a white man has committed crime because they never tell his religion, they never tell you his nationality, they never tell you his political origins, he's usually crazy. A couple of years after 9-11, someone drove a plane into the Texas IRS building. I was horrified, I said, oh my god, not again. And I was told this in the class, one of the students, because it was the early days of smartphones and all my students said, Dr. Khan, did you hear this news? Someone drove. I said, did they say anything about his religion? They said, no, they think it's an isolated case. I said, oh, so they have no evidence, no proof, nothing, and they still think it's isolated, so it must be a white male who is not Muslim. And that is the same case. So there is this media bias. But the point is, it's not about lamenting it. We need to do something about it. Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Al-lazina in makkalnahum fil ard, aqamu salata wa atu zakata wa amalu bil am, wa ma'aruf wa nahiyani al-munkar, wa lillahi aqibatu al-umur. This is an ayah that I will invite all of you to go back home and think a little bit more about it. It is 2241. I believe that this ayah should be the constitution for American Muslims. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. He says that once we have established you in a land, then it is your job to establish salah, establish zakat, and do, encourage good and forbid evil. And the outcome of every event is in Allah's hand. That means you do the jihad, you do the struggle. The victory, it is in the hands of Allah. This, this, this order, Amru bil Ma'roof wa Nahyan al Munka, this is a statement about public policy. It's not telling people go and pray in the masjid and go and fast in the Ramadan. That is already included in the ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Aqimu salawatu zakah. It basically means that you have to establish your rituals. The five pillars of Islam has to be established. It's included in that. So to do dawa about five pillars is not part of this Amr bil Maruf or Nahi Anil Munkar. It's about public policy. It's about maslaha. It's about public interest. So the question you Muslims should need to ask after what happened in North Carolina, this tragedy of assault on Islam and Muslims, and especially on American Muslims, this is the opening salvo. This is not the end of hatred. This is the beginning of hatred. We have reached a state where words are being converted into deeds. So what do we do? <clears throat> there was this Sufi who used to sit in the mountains and pray all the time. One day he came to the village and he was horrified by what was going on. There was Islamophobia everywhere. Everybody hated Muslims. Everybody said bad things about Muslims. Muslim kids were beaten in their schools. They were being bullied. He was horrified. There was poverty and marginalization and war and fitna and disease. He ran back to his special place and said, and he started doing dua and said, Ya Allah, what is happening? Ya Allah, don't you see the poverty that my people are suffering? Do you, do you see the violence that is being done to my people? What have you done, Ya Allah? And a voice came to him and he simply said, I have created you. That was what he got from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
the point was, fine, there's all this mystery. What are you doing sitting in this corner and praying? Your job is to go out there and serve them, fight them, <coughs> defend them, work for the struggle, and that is the same thing to us. Just sitting here and talking about it is not. How do we respond to this event? How do we go and bring this Amr bil Maruf or Nahiyan in Munkar in our lives here as American Muslims? We are established, mashallah. All of you are well to do. You are safe compared to other Muslims in, in the Muslim world, which is incredible. Peace is from Allah. We are safe, we are secure, we are prosperous. There's a website called Global Reach. Go there and just put in your annual income or your net worth and you will find out. I guarantee you that most of you are in the top 1% of the world. That 99% of the people who live in the rest of the world are poorer than most people in this room. MashaAllah, SubhanAllah. But that means with, like Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. So with this, this aspect, so with this wealth, with this security, what can we do? And that is where we need to engage. There are two things we have to do. One is we have to push back against the media and push back aggressively. We cannot take it anymore. There is no way they can assault. They can't make mockery of Islam because somebody somewhere burned one man. In this country, they were burning black people by the thousands for decades. Okay? They burned thousands of black people for literally for decades. They have no business to turn around and ask us questions about our values and our religion and our identity because just some one guy somewhere was done this. But we need to ask that question of ourselves as how can our brothers and sisters do this? Those of you who know the history of the Muslim Brotherhood, in the 1920s they assassinated the Prime Minister of Egypt and someone went and asked him, what do you say this Muslim brothers have killed the Prime Minister? And he responded by saying, they are neither brothers nor Muslim. Laisa Ikhwan or Laisa Muslim. Laisu. They are all not Muslim. We have to ask ourselves that. We have to push back against that because radicalism there will increase Islamophobia here. In the same week, another American daughter was killed in Iraq who was also doing the same thing that Dia was doing. Kaila. She went to work with Doctors Without Borders on the border of Syria and Turkey. She was volunteering and helping Muslims who needed medical help, and she was killed. We have to also challenge. That's what Amr bil Maruf is to encourage good and combat evil, just not evil against us, but evil against everybody. So we have to do things. It's not a time to talk, and to do things is best. The Quran says this, and the Prophet ﷺ also said, the best way to respond to evil is with good. Do not respond to bad and do not do bad things. Do not initiate bad things, do not respond to bad things in a bad way. That is not the way of Prophet The story of Taif, you all know how he responded. If he wanted, he would have flattened them. You just have to say the word. The angel could have done it for them. But that's not what the role of the Prophet is. That's not what mercy to all of humanity is. The challenge for Muslims here is what we were saying America's challenge was 15 years ago. We said to win the hearts and minds of Muslims. Our challenge today is to win the hearts and minds of everybody else. We cannot shame them into becoming good people. You cannot berate them and send hateful messages back and hope that they will learn and become. The only way for you to respond is by doing good and by engagement. More and more people in America, those Americans who know Muslims personally have extremely positive views of Islam and Muslims. Only those who don't know a Muslim personally have negative views. And less than 5% Americans know Muslims personally. It's quite possible you have many colleagues who don't know that you are a Muslim, but they may know that you are a great person. I invite you all to join me in prayer for those three children.
of the old man who were killed so brutally in North Carolina. I also invite you all to pray with me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may show guidance to all of us. Your hidayah for us to value life. Above all, value life. Value the life of Muslims apparently doesn't matter, but life of others also doesn't matter to Muslims. I also hope that we will not let this also be another episode that we cover, we post a Facebook status, a Twitter comment, and then forget about it. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring something good and higher out of this tragic event. And with that, we shall start to pray, inshallah. Allah Akbar, 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 Allah